Greetings, brothers and sisters. I'm Professor Spira, and today we will continue our discussion of fasting. I will be reading some excerpts from Professor Arnold Eretz Mucus's Diet Healing System, annotated, revised, and edited by Professor Spira. But these excerpts also may be found in Rational Fasting for physical, mental, and spiritual rejuvenation. Lesson 19. As long as the waste is in the circulation, you feel miserable during a fast. As soon as it is through the kidneys, you feel fine. Two or three days later, and the same process repeats itself. It must now be clear to you why conditions change so often during a fast. It must now be clear to you why it is, uh, it is possible for you to feel unusually better and stronger on the 20th day than on the 5th, for instance. So we talked about this pretty much in the previous videos where important to the kidneys, getting the kidneys to filter this waste uh, that starts to happen when you get into the fasting process and that every three days you begin to go through a cycle. Now this can be different. It's, it's not a scientific, it's a general principle. Uh, but for most people, every three days you can kind of feel uh, a, a kind of cycle. It's, it's a, they, like these little mini cycles. If you do a longer fast, uh, that's one reason why Eric recommends uh, for people that are getting started the three day fast or up to three days to experience a full, you know, time around this, this little cycle. But this entire cleansing work through continued contracting of the tissues uh, becoming lean must be done by and with the older with the original old blood composition of the patient and consequently a long fast especially a too long fast may become in fact a crime if the sick organism is too greatly clogged up by waste fasters who died from too long a fast did not die from lack of food but actually suffocated in and with their own waste. Now think about that for a second, because this is a question uh, which, and I understand the question, uh, where a lot of people say, well, what about starving people uh, in, in, in where there's a lot of, uh, you know, where they try to tug on your heartstrings, where they're, uh, it, like, to me, it's kind of exploitative. Sometimes you look at these organizations and nonprofits and really look at where their money's going. It's not necessarily going to these starving people in Ethiopia. But that aside, people are familiar with images of starving people being used uh, as a, a, to, to scare folks. And there are certain cultures uh, that are so fearful of starvation because there was starvation in the past or what we're, what we'll call starvation but the inability to, to 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 consume something that will help you control your elimination uh so if when you have peoples and entire lineages you know there's bloodlines where that is hardwired to a certain extent into someone's bloodline that this fear of starvation, this fear of not having enough food, there, there's not, there's not necessarily, there's usually not the same fear, at least in the, in the United States. And I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not telling people to, to be scared of, of, of overeating in that way. You know, I won't get into that, but we, we don't, there's a lot of people that'll have this like, oh man, you you know, won't you starve if you you know you miss a couple of days of food? Aren't you hungry? Aren't you you know starving? Because there's this hardwired fear of not getting enough food. Uh, uh, questions about why we eat, you know, we'll even get into the, that. That's sort of another discussion. We don't look at it in terms of when I say we people, I know the practice of mucus's diet based on Eretz. Uh, 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 based on our interpretation of what Eric had to say, you know, we we don't look at nutrition in terms of well, we got it. You you have to get all these the all this stuff. If you, you know, if you want to look at it like that, that's fine. Uh, we look at it as 
uh, being able to control the elimination. So when you have people, whether they're starving people anywhere in the world or uh, you, you look at the pictures of the, of the Holocaust victims, like, like Brother Air said, he's done long fasting periods, uh, but he's, he's never looked ama real emaciated. And if, pe if he didn't tell people he was fasting, they wouldn't know that he would just be kind of slender and in his longest fast, he's, I've seen people that eat every day that are uric acid types that are way skinnier than Brother Air is on, on, on his 200th day of a fast. So, again, we're not promoting that kind of long fasting, but expand your mind. Expand your mind on the possibilities of human physiology and accept that we don't necessarily know what we think we know in terms of what we've been told about the body what we've been told we need and 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 and, and need more of and oh it's okay you know put uh you know we, we have to be real uh you know cautious and look at that look, look at the way that nutrition has been pimped out to scare you see one in in sales that's one thing that they you know they try to uh, do is sort in, in depending on what they're trying to sell is is use fear, so they're using or they're so that with the watch some of the the milk commercials, you know where oh if you if you uh, if you don't drink enough milk three glasses a day you fight osteoporosis and this and but then the studies suggest that people that drank this cooked uh you know cat <laughs> say cooked cow piss. Uh, you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, the pasteurized, unnatural, not meant for humans to consume on any level. A grown up has about 200 bones, a child has many more, which grow into each other gradually. That's why a child needs even more calcium. And what's a natural thing for that? A pint of milk helps your bones. 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 And that's a natural law. <coughs> because? Purpose. Because. Right here. <laughs> I mean, most of you that's watching this video know, know all this, so I know you know, maybe, but if you share this with a family member, then maybe, uh, maybe I'm talking to them, but uh, we have to just really understand that this is, uh, th th <laughs> There's just, there's just so much stuff out there that we, we had just been lied to so much and, uh, and, uh, you know, the blind leading the blind. And so, uh, yeah, I gave all of my fasters lemonade with a trace of honey or brown sugar for loosening and thinning the mucus in the circulation. Lemon juice and fruit acids of all kinds neutralize the stickiness of mucus and pus. Uh, acid paste cannot be used for sticking purposes. So, so here, you know, we're we're getting an introduction into Eretz lemonade fasting methodology. Of course, years later, lemonade fasting. Uh, gained a bit of popularity but somebody changed it up and marketed it and it's it's lost its origins right here with professor Arnold Eric. yet master cleanse uh and all that kind of stuff has become uh you know has become almost a mainstream like oh a 21 day you know cleanse and lemonade and put cayenne pepper and all this kind of stuff Era didn't recommend cayenne pepper, uh, but the fundamental of lemonade fast is right here you know, in Arnold Eric's work. If a patient has ever taken drugs over their entire life period, 
which are stored up in the body like the waste from food, their condition might easily become serious or even dangerous when these poisons enter the circulation, when they take their first fast. Palpitation of the heart, headaches, nervousness may set in, and especially insomnia. I saw patients eliminate drugs they had taken as long as 40 years before. Symptoms such as described above are blamed on the fast by everybody and especially doctors. So when you're fasting, you always have to ask that, well, what, what did I eat? What did I take for years? Did you, did you take, I took pharmaceutical medications daily, two to three times a day since around age seven to when I started practicing the mucus diet uh, in age 18, 19, uh, every day. And so it took me years to the point where uh, maybe it was, it was five years ago, maybe, uh, but I, I went through an elimination where I was fasting and I started tasting the chalky taste of an old medicine that I used to take called Seldane. And, I, and it, it was like coming out of my, and this is after years of practicing the mucus diet and I had done long fast in, in the past. So this idea that you can just sort of do a long fast and heal everything and go over the rest of your life just perfectly, that's, that's problematic. But I, I started getting this kind of chalky taste in and I was like, wait a minute, that taste, Tastes like Seldane. What? Uh, and then I was I was going through some symptoms that I hadn't that I don't normally go through when I fast when I go through an elimination kind of fasting period. And I was like, wait a minute, these symptoms. I was like, let me look something up. And I looked up the side effects to Seldane. And another one that I took was, uh, for quite a long time was Allegra D. So I looked up the side effects to those, which I, I didn't experience all of those side effects when I, had, when I took the medicine. Uh, nas na uh, was that Nasonex, whatever it was. Because one of the only things I did, I did experience, uh, not during this fast, but one of the only things I really remember experiencing was nosebleeds. I used to get nosebleeds almost every other day. And that was, uh, if I was taking Allegra D and then I started using Flonase or not, was it Flonase or Nasonex, one of the, whatever it was prescription. Uh, and I, I would get nosebleeds. And so, I mean, I'm, I, I'm in high school. I mean, just think about like, I normalized that I'm in high school and at any moment, my nose can start bleeding. So I'm, I always have a box of tissues with me and then my nose starts bleeding. And so I'm, I'm sticking tissue in my nose and the, you know, the blood is starting to come down on the tissue. That's real attractive and cool. When you're trying, you know, in high school, you'd want to be cool, right? Well, how, what's cooler than just getting a nosebleed out of nowhere? But I blame that on those drugs because when I, in periods when I stopped taking Allegra D and took something else, nosebleeds would go away, but the uh, but all my my, my allergies, so-called allergy symptoms came back, so I always went back to Allegra D. So suffice it to say, I took this stuff for years and years and years, uh, and so within the first couple of years of practicing the mucus diet, I didn't get all that out of my system. That stuff was, is, was like deeply embedded. So all of a sudden, you know, 10, 11 years into practicing the mucus diet, I'm going, I'm fasting and going through an elimination where I can taste cell name, uh, and you know, Allegra, the, the Allegra taste, you know, I, I'm tasting that in my mouth. I'm going through a lot of these symptoms that are associated with, uh, uh, and, you know, there's like uh, uh, certain things, and you can look that up. Look up Seldane, look up Allegra D. The side effects to those are you know, the, the dizziness and uh, the, the foggy brain and all and uh, uh, fatigue. All, all of these things were from that. Now, again, even to, a lot of people say, Well, you were fat, you know, you fasted too long, you didn't get enough of this, or you didn't get enough fats or you didn't, you know, there's all of these explanations and everybody has an opinion 
it's usually not based on, well, what did you used to eat or what did you used to take? But that's so fundamental. Everybody wants to blame the food. And even people that have been real heavy into Mucus's diet or in Arnold Eric's work, they, they go back to that. They go back to blaming something else, blaming the food. Pints of milk helps your bones and that's a natural law. As always, I really appreciate you tuning in. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And until next time, peace, love, and breath.